Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. This is the News Bites segment where we break up a bunch of the big news stories in space and astronomy this week and we video them at you. Now this is of course a smaller version of the newsletter that I write every week that you can get in your email box every Friday. But we understand some people want to have the video instead of reading all of that wall of text. So enjoy the news. First, some spaceflight news. We had a record breaking flight for a Falcon 9 rocket. On June 17th, Falcon 9 launched another crop of Starlink satellites. And this was the 13th flight of this specific booster, which is kind of amazing. Now, at this point, SpaceX has done over 100 booster reuses. And the goal is eventually for them to be able to use a booster 15 times. So this one booster that launched these Starlinks is getting to about near the end of its life. But still, we're seeing this one with 13 others with 12. All of their boosters are being reused a large number of times. And of course, this is helping to bring down the costs for SpaceX, they've now launched 1000s of the Starlink satellites, but also to bring down costs for launching commercial satellites, NASA launches, etc. So reuse in the spaceflight industry is definitely a good thing. The space launch system did its fourth attempt at its wet dress rehearsal. And what this is, is that NASA takes the space launch system, which is of course going to be the rocket that's going to carry humans back to the moon, they take it out to the launch pad, and then go through all of the pre flight checks that they would normally do. And so in this case, they filled it with fuel, and they did the countdown as if they were going to launch the rocket and they got all the way down to the 29 second mark before launch, and then they had to abort the launch. There was a problem with a hydrogen leak in their ground equipment, but NASA said that Space Launch System fulfilled 90% of their pre-flight checklist requirements, and they figure that's good enough. Now, when is it going to fly? Right now, NASA is saying no earlier than August 2022, but if there's more issues, more delays, if they run into any other problems, we could see the flight slipping into 2023. So here's hoping there's no more problems and we get to see this gigantic rocket take off. Congratulations to South Korea. They have joined the countries that are capable of sending rockets into space. They become the 10th nation capable of orbital rocketry. And so just this week, they launched their Nuri rocket. And they actually tried to launch back in October, but they had a failure with the launch and didn't make it to orbit. This time around, the flight went perfectly. They were able to place a test satellite into a 700 kilometer orbit, and everything seemed to have gone fine. So now South Korea is able to launch rockets. China is planning a Mars sample return mission. We heard this week that China is planning its own version of a Mars sample return mission. Now you've probably heard that the European Space Agency and NASA are working on their version of their Mars sample return mission. Right now, the Perseverance rover is collecting samples that's going across the surface of Mars, it's dropping these samples behind it as it goes. And eventually, a another follow on mission is going to send a chase rover that's going to pick up all these samples, bring them back to a rocket, the rocket is going to take off from the surface of Mars and bring these samples back to Earth. The Chinese announced that they're doing their version of a sample return mission. Their mission is going to be a little different. They're going to fly to Mars. They're going to land. They may deploy a four legged rover that will rove around the area where the lander happened and pick up various samples and then bring them back. It's going to have some kind of ability to drill, ability to scoop gather up a bunch of interesting samples in the area where it is, and then it's going to send a rocket back to Earth and put those into the hands of the scientists. And this actually fits quite well with the capabilities of the Chinese Space Agency at this point. They had their recent sample return mission to the moon, which was able to bring samples back. And then they also have their rover mission to the surface of Mars. And so you can now put those two together. It's a you're going to need a bigger rocket to get off of the surface of Mars. The Chinese plan is to send their mission in 2028 to arrive and 
collect its sample and put it back into the hands of scientists, probably by 2031. And that actually beats the time that's estimated by NASA and ESA for their mission by about two years. So in theory, the Chinese are going to get their sample by 2031. And NASA will get its sample by 2033. Now, obviously, getting the samples from Perseverance, which is a really capable rover that can scan the surroundings, it has a helicopter flying to scout, it's gathering only the most interesting samples from the surface of Mars and collecting them all carefully. And then having this incredible sample pack back on Earth is going to be amazing. But nobody's ever brought a sample of material back from Mars. So if the Chinese are able to do this, it will still be tremendously valuable for scientists. In fact, scientists are still studying the moon sample that they brought back. And that's been really interesting as well. So we'll see how it all plays out. Asteroid Ryugu is filled with amino acids. The Japanese Space Agency's Hayabusa 2 mission flew to asteroid Ryugu and performed a bunch of tests on this asteroid, it shot an anti tank weapon at it, it dropped a hopper onto its surface, and it was able to collect a sample and bring it back to Earth. And scientists here on Earth have been studying the sample from this asteroid. And what they've learned is that it has a surprising amount of organic material on its surface. And it's possible that asteroid Ryugu might actually be a dead comet a comet that's had all of its volatiles blown off. And then what you're left with is just this residue of organic material left on the surface. But what's really interesting is that over the time that they've been studying this, they've been adding more and more amino acids that they've discovered in this asteroid. And originally, they'd announced fairly quickly that they found 10. And now the total number of these is up to 20. And so what it's kind of looking like is that the kinds of asteroids or maybe comets like Ryugu were able to impact the Earth early on in its history and deliver not just the raw materials like carbon and hydrogen and water and things like that, but actually more advanced, more complicated chemicals that would give life a more of a jumpstart. So it's quite an exciting discovery to see that the ingredients for life were already found were already present in these uh, asteroids out in the solar system. We got a mineral map of asteroid Psyche. And asteroid 16 Psyche is one of the most fascinating objects in the solar system. And I often put it on my list of places that I would love to know more about. Well, good news, NASA is sending a mission to asteroid 16 Psyche called Psyche. And what makes Psyche really interesting, the, the asteroid, is that it is incredibly dense, almost entirely made of metal. And so what astronomers think happened was that this is the exposed core of a protoplanet that went through some just colossal impact had all of the lighter material, you know, the rock blown away. And what's left is the core, the metal core. And it's even possible that it's still molten metal inside, and it could have volcanoes of metal. And so in preparation for this mission, astronomers used some of the most powerful telescopes here on Earth to start to try and map out the surface of Psyche to get a much better sense of where they should start to do their studies when the spacecraft actually arrives. Of course, it's a very rough very bad map compared to how amazing it's going to be when we get the spacecraft actually there up close in orbit, taking pictures like the other orbital missions that we've had around the solar system. If you're enjoying the space news that we're bringing you, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? This is a chance for you to directly support the work that I do and not just me, all of the people doing the video editing, audio editing, all of the writing on universe today, it's a pretty big team. And this allows me to be able to pay everybody's salaries. And of course, if you join our Patreon, you will get behind the scenes information, you'll get our videos with no ads, and I will remove all of the advertising from universe today for you for life. So even if you stop becoming a patron, you'll never have to see another ad on universe today ever again. So if you want to join our community, go to patreon.com slash universe today. We might have an explanation for Sharon's red spot. When NASA's New Horizon mission went to Pluto, it also took some pictures of Pluto's moon Sharon. And Sharon is big, like 
Pluto and Charon can properly be classified as a binary dwarf system. They're so big and they're tidally locked to each other. And when it took the pictures of Sharon, it found a lot of really interesting features. But one that's really puzzling is this large red blob up at the moon's North Pole. And the question is, why is this happening? And now astronomers have been studying this information for quite a while, the photos taken by New Horizons. And what they think is going on now is that methane is freezing out of the atmosphere up at the North Pole of Sharon. And then the ultraviolet light from the sun is turning it red. And in fact, astronomers have seen a lot of objects in the Kuiper belt with a reddish hue to them. So you've got this really cool interaction between the methane that's in the Sharon atmosphere, very thin, tenuous atmosphere is then interacting with the ultraviolet light coming from the sun with the surface, and you've got these cycles going on that creates this red hue to the top of the moon. Really fascinating. We have to go back. Galaxies were more active earlier than we ever expected. Astronomers have been studying a fairly well known galaxy that was first discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope almost a decade ago. And the galaxy was found thanks to a gravitational lens. You've got a giant galaxy cluster, you've got the Hubble Space Telescope, and then you've got this galaxy. And the galaxy cluster acts like a natural telescope focusing the light, allowing Hubble to see much farther than it normally can. And in this case, it's seeing a galaxy that is just 700 million years after the Big Bang. And when it was discovered, this was the record. Since then, this record has been broken a couple more times as Hubble continues to use bigger, better, clusters as better telescopes to see even farther. Like we don't know what dark matter is, but we know how to use it as a telescope. It's crazy. Anyway, so what's surprising about this galaxy is that it is a lot more active than astronomers ever thought. Remember, it's only 700 million years after like the formation of the universe. And yet, there seems to be evidence of supernova explosions, outflows of gas, a lot of star forming activity much earlier than anyone expected. And this is the kind of the perfect sort of object that James Webb is going to be able to look at. Hubble was only able to see it because it used a galaxy cluster as a telescope as a as an extra lens in its telescope. James Webb will be able to do these kinds of observations directly. And in fact, when it uses galaxy clusters as natural telescopes, it's going to be able to see some of the first stars forming at the beginning of the universe. So again, just another good reason to get excited for James Webb. Astronomers merge the data from four dead telescopes. So take a look at this picture. You're looking at an image of the large Magellanic cloud. And this is one of the dwarf galaxies that is orbiting around the Milky Way. And this picture was taken using archival data from four dead telescopes. So the first telescope that was used is the Herschel Space Telescope. This was a space telescope from the European Space Agency, and it's designed to observe in the infrared, sort of similar to James Webb, but not as far infrared as James Webb can do. And then on top of this, astronomers added data from the Planck telescope. And Planck has been used to make astronomical observations, but also it's the telescope that helped measure the cosmic microwave background radiation to a level of precision that we have never seen before. It's how we get this 13.8 billion year age of the universe. And then they blended in two other dead telescopes, one called IRAS and one called Kobe. Both of those are decades old, long dead, and they were able to produce this image. And so what you're seeing in this is essentially information about the galaxy. So the red areas are hydrogen, essentially the raw material for forming new stars. We know the large Magellanic cloud is a very actively star forming region of the universe. You've got the green is cold dust, and then the warmer dust is in blue. And so when you add all of those colors together, you get this incredible image. And again, this is four different telescopes, some of which died decades ago, being able to come together to produce this one image. Some of the moon's water might have come from the Earth. 
We've known for a few years now that there is water on the surface of the moon. It's been seen by India's Chandrayaan spacecraft. It's been detected by the Sophia aircraft and the Chinese announced that they detected water under the feet of the Chang'e 5 lander. And so the question then is like, where did this water come from? And the assumption is that it's probably like comets in the same way that Earth might have gotten its water or maybe it formed in place or it's just water in the in the inner solar system as the moon was forming, or maybe hydrogen coming from the sun embedded into the surface of the moon and latched on to oxygen and formed water molecules. But a new idea suggests that actually some of this water could have been coming from the Earth's atmosphere. And so we know that the Earth is losing some of its hydrogen and oxygen to space through interactions with the solar wind. And some of this atmosphere's lost atmosphere could make its way out to the moon, embed onto the surface of the moon, recombine and turn back into water again. And it's estimated that maybe 1% of the lost atmosphere coming from the Earth actually ended up on the moon. And actually, this is a question that was recently asked on one of our question and answers show, where did the moon's water come from? And I actually didn't know this piece of research when I gave my answer. So it's kind of cool to get an update. And now of course, I can include this in future answers. But if you want, you should definitely check out our most recent question and answers show. Finally, a fast radio burst that repeats. Astronomers have known about fast radio bursts since about 2007. And these are real mysteries. They're like some kind of bright radio flash that suddenly appears randomly in the sky. And most of them of the hundreds that have been seen so far, the very few of them will ever repeat. And so you have to essentially scan the entire sky. Occasionally, you get one of these fast radio bursts, you try to get, understand what's causing it but then you never get a chance to see it again. But now astronomers have found one that does seem to be repeating. It actually has two different cycles. It has a very bright flash, and then it has a very faint flash. And astronomers have been able to pin it down to a very specific galaxy that's about 3 billion light years away. And you know, like what are fast radio bursts? Astronomers still don't really know. But one of the leading theories is that they're a magnetar. This is a type of neutron star, a dead star that's formed in a supernova when a very massive star explodes. And it's believed that maybe magnetars are formed when there's some kind of binary interaction with the neutron star and some companion star that whips it up and causes these really powerful magnetic fields. And then as these magnetic fields can kind of crackle and recombine on the surface of the magnetar, you get this flash. And most of the time, we never see them repeating. Or maybe they just repeat on really long cycles that nobody's ever caught so far. But the fact that you've got one that's repeating on a regular basis could help figure out what all of them are, or maybe it's a completely different class of object. So the mystery continues, but at least we've got a repeating fast radio burst to study. We've got a cool interview this week that you're going to want to check out. It's with Dr. Martin Barstow. He is with the Gaia mission and worked on the data release three that just came out last week. We announced it last week talking about it in the new segment. And then I got a chance to actually interview somebody and get all of the questions answered that I have about Gaia. And so I think you'll really enjoy it. If, you're, if you don't walk out of this as excited about Gaia as I am, I, I don't know what else I can do. And we also had a pretty amazing interview with Lori Garver, who was once working with NASA and oversaw the commercial crew activity at NASA. She has now left NASA, has written a memoir about her experiences during that period. And it's a very fascinating eye opening conversation. I think you'll really enjoy it, learn about the rise of SpaceX and the other new space companies, what kind of influence the government was having and some of the traditional aerospace firms. Yeah. So that's on the weekly space hangout for last week. Of course, these stories are just a subset of the articles that I write in my weekly email newsletter. We've got links to all of the stories that we cover here in this show, which is in the description. But if you want to get the full version, the one that I write that is like a magazine that comes to your mailbox every Friday, you should go to universe today.com slash newsletter. I write every word. It's completely free. Join the 50,000 people who get this every week.
If you want to get an audio version of all the videos that we do, including this very episode, you should subscribe to the podcast. Go to universetoday.com slash podcast, or just search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you to everyone who supports us on Patreon. A special thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. Your support means the universe to us. All right. Those were all the news stories for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week.